Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, the challenges of our Latin America. Our guest, Fred Mills, professor at the Bowie State University in Maryland and author of numerous publications. Fred Mills, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me. Fred, among all the challenges facing our Latin America, which one is the one that worries you the most? I think the greatest challenge at this moment is maintaining independence. Because the independence of the Americas is the condition, is a fundamental condition for being each country being able to pursue its own destiny. And that's right now um, not something that's guaranteed. Which country would you say that is more threatened in that sense? At this moment, it's Venezuela that is under attack. And we can see this coming uh, not only from what's called the Lima Group. These are countries that are very closely allied with the project of the United States. Fourteen countries. Fourteen countries to reestablish its hegemony in the region. But also within the organization of American states itself, the Secretary General has taken it upon himself to be extremely partisan in an ongoing attack on Venezuela. And by attack, I mean not only an effort to undermine the present government in Venezuela, but even threats now of a military intervention against this sovereign country. Given the fact that Luis Almagro, the Secretary General of the OAS, came here uh, for many people thank to the uh, if you want the prestige of the former president Mujica of Uruguay, he was his personal secretary and also his foreign minister. Definitely a person from a progressive philosophy and then can get to Washington and make a U-turn or a 180 degrees turn and became what the mouth, the mouthpiece of whom? Yes, well, he's become the mouthpiece of a policy to, I believe, to reestablish U.S. hegemony in the region and to impose the neoliberal model in the name of concern for human rights. And who's Venezuela. preaching that, that philosophy? Well, this, this philosophy basically since around 1989, um, there was an idea with the, with the imminent collapse of, of Soviet Union that history is over and that the only feasible model for the whole world is the neoliberal one. The model where uh, we privatize much of the commons and public services, where we impose austerity, where we take loans from the International Monetary Fund and then pay the interest on the bonds uh, by cutting some of the money being used for social services. And we reduce the taxes for the wealthy. Yes, I forgot and, to mention that. And we impose austerity plans for the rest of the population. For the rest of the population. We see this taking place right now in Argentina, where the model is being applied. And the poverty has increased Poverty, unemployment, and uh, the mass demonstrations uh, that are happening against the government, and the response of the government to now uh, allow the military uh, to play a critical role in public security. Is Almagro the mouthpiece of the United States? Well, I think he really believes uh, in what he's doing. In other words, he, he, he auth he's taken up the cause of the opposition, the hardliners in the, not just the opposition, the hardliners in the opposition uh, in Venezuela. But objectively, yes, he's fulfilling the objectives of the Washington For consensus. many people, not only in Uruguay, that he was coming from there, He's a traitor because he was coming here with a hat of uh, defending the progressive movements and to be a unifier. And now he's preaching military intervention against Venezuela. So is he a traitor? Well, he's someone who has betrayed um, his office. You know, as a private citizen, he has every right to go around calling for interventions and things of that sort. But as a secretary general representing uh, 34 countries with a diversity of ideologies and points of view, he's exceeding his function and his role, violating uh, the guidelines of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, so um, he should resign, frankly. And the case of uh, Mexico, we're talking that starting on December 1st, a new president, a progressive president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, 
How would you say that will be the impact of his uh, presidency in the geopolitical terms in Latin America? Well, he's going to inject um, some sanity and rationality in the inter-American system. And I say this because he's already pronounced that Mexico is not going to play an interventionist role in Latin America. It's going to respect the sovereignty of the nations of the Americas, and he's going to be in favor of dialogue over coercion to resolve differences. And that's really important. And in the case of the Group of Lima, we're talking about the 14 countries that, as of today, with Peña Nieto at the helm of Mexico, is almost leading the attack against Venezuela and the progressive countries. Do you think that the Group of Lima is going to see a change of position with Mexico now under AMLO? Oh, yes. And the group, Grupo Lima, the Lima Group, is already fracturing. We see this, for example, with the sanctions. The sanctions have made it very difficult for Brazil, for example, to pay its $40 million debt for electricity that's being provided uh, by Venezuela. So it's interrupting commerce between nations of the Lima Group. Also, the Lima Group, uh, in September, came out with a declaration denouncing the position of the Secretary General for openly saying, when he was in Cucuta, Colombia, for openly suggesting that the military option against Venezuela should be on the table. This took off the mask of the Lima Group and caused great discomfort because you don't say what's behind your machinations. Among the 14 countries, three countries didn't condemn the words of Almagro about uh, a military intervention. We're talking the U.S., we're talking Canada, and we are talking Colombia with the new president, and Ivan Duque. Uh, exactly, um, four of them. How you, how you see Ivan Duque playing in, in this new era of uh, intervention or attacking or bashing the no, progressive countries? It, it's very unfortunate that uh, with Ivan Duque coming into office, we don't see a change in the government of Colombia with regard to the ongoing assassinations of community leaders and human rights defenders. So since January 2016, we have about three, 343. 343 uh, social leaders have been murdered. And this year, as an average, one every two days. One every two days. And so no strong denunciations and, 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 and actions to bring a halt uh, to these murders and the thousands more who are being threatened. And then we hear from the new ambassador uh, for Colombia that... In Adeo, yes? At, yes, the new ambassador saying, oh, well, we, uh, we think what Almagro said was fine. The military option should be on the table. So now you have the country that serves as a base, nine U.S. military bases, that has paramilitaries crossing back and forth along the frontier region with Venezuela, that sponsors military exercises to threaten Venezuela. Now we have this country coming out explicitly threatening a military intervention. And Almagro doesn't denounce that. Oh, no, no. They're actually supporting uh, Almagro's posture. Now, Almagro would like to walk back what he said. It's obvious from, from some of his tweets. But it's too late because what he's been doing since he took the office of Secretary General, is he's been waging an extreme partisan campaign against Venezuela, but not using the same strong concern about human rights for what was going on in Mexico. The tens of thousands have disappeared. What's going on in Colombia, where you have 7.6 million displaced peoples. What's going on in Honduras, where we just had elections with his own mission, his own observer mission, saying serious irregularities. Fraud. Fraud. The list can go on. And so this is what Larry Burns called selective indignation. When you see selective indignation, you want to ask yourself, what's behind it? And what is behind it? The question of the day. What's behind it is, in my view, uh, and uh, Rex Tillerson said this himself, it's time to rehabilitate the Monroe Doctrine. Which is? Well, to put it in very basic terms, it's to secure Latin America and the Caribbean 
as the backyard, the sphere of influence of the United States to the exclusion of other great powers like Russia and China. But really, it's too late. We live in a multipolar world. So do you believe that what did happen lately was that the U.S. government was sort of busy dealing with the Middle East? Yeah. And in a way, disregard its interest in Latin America. And now they say that the influence of China and Russia was taking a big chunk, and they want quickly to try to recover. Well, I go part way, part way with this analysis, because I think it's important to point out that the attack on Venezuela has been going on for 20 years. So it's not just in bad times when they have an economic crisis that they're under attack. It was in good times when there was prosperity, when millions were being lifted out of poverty in Venezuela. There were still attacks on the country. There was a coup in Venezuela that lasted two days. Chavez was restored to power. There was an oil strike to try to bring down the government. There was a recall. Ref this, I'm talking about 2002, 2003, 2004. So the attack on Venezuela is constant. And it's not just for control of the resources. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world and lots of minerals. It is for what then? It's because Venezuela, since Chavez was elected in December 1998, has stood for and promoted with some success Latin American integration and independence. The formation of associations like UNASUR, UNASUR CENAC, ALBA. ALBA. Exactly. And these associations were built on the premise that through cooperation, through exchange, commerce, trade, that Latin America itself can become a power, a pole of influence. So the idea is to dismantle integration? Dismantle integration because integration and independence, okay, are conditions of promoting a multipolar world and not succumbing to the domination of any great power. And this is what made Chavez so dangerous, was that Chavez stood for the independence and integration of the Americas. So uh, what, you, what to expect? We're talking about uh, bashing, as you said, through mouthpieces like uh, for many Almagro doing that, that, that job, um, trying to put in jail, uh, as they did Lula, trying to do it with Cristina, Dilma is out of power, Correa is against the ropes, Jorge Glass is already in jail. This is a new phenomenon that former President Correa says is the lawfare, is the new version, the 2.0 version of uh, military coups in Latin America now is judiciary coups? Yes, but none of this has worked against Venezuela, which is, which is why we hear the, tr the, tremor, the tremors of war. We don't want to see another Libya in the Americas. We don't want to see the destruction of thousands of lives in the Americas. We want dialogue and peace, and when I say we, I'm referring not only to the peoples of, of, of Latin America and the Caribbean, but we in the United States. We don't want more war. We don't want more militarism. It's not the solution. For example, there is an agreement here that uh, the Senator uh, Ru Marco Rubio has become, if you want, an advisor on Latin America to President Trump. This is an extreme right senator from Florida, from Cuban origin, that they have the agenda of the Cubans of Miami and the Venezuelans of Miami. How come someone at that with those backgrounds could be the close ear of the President of the United States? What is the President of the United States saying when he's getting together in a room and hearing what Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz has to say about Latin America? I, this is a great question. I mean, Marco Rubio scouring the hills for communists day in and day out. It's a very extreme position. You know, there's a, there's an opposition is, oh, is, is a good thing to have. The Venezuelan opposition has hardliners many of them based in Miami and Bogota. And those are the people that Marco Rubio is supporting. He didn't support the opposition that comes from some of the same parties of what's called the MUD, Mesa Unidad Democratica, the Democratic Unity Roundtable. He didn't support the more moderate elements of the opposition who ran a candidate 
in a presidential election in May. So what we have is someone with great influence supporting the most hardline elements of the Venezuelan opposition. And this means that we're not giving peace, that the U.S. is not giving peace a chance. And in the case of President Trump, that he's preaching since he was a candidate to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico. What that wall symbolizes? I think the wall symbolizes an ideology. Which the is? The ideology of white supremacy. And we can't separate this racism from the politics of immigration as it's being implemented now. The only way you can separate children from their families is if you dehumanize them. Imagine if these were European children. Imagine if these were children being separated from their parents by Venezuelan authorities. You don't want to imagine that because then it would become an outrage. So we have a contradiction here. The wall represents a racist immigration policy. We have to be frank about this. There's a way to there's a way to have procedures, rational procedures, immigration reform, without bashing Mexicans, without dehumanizing migrants. There's a way to do this in a humane and rational manner. There are many observers that they, and they say that it's perverse the way they painted the situation in the border. And they say that it's perverse because the trade practices of the U.S., for example, preaching free trade and doing unjust trade with Mexico through NAFTA and in Central America and with CAFTA, Central America Free Trade Agreement, because, for example, they subsidize their products, they invade with their products our countries, they leave millions of agricultural workers with no jobs, that they have no other option than to move to the north trying to make a living. So these analysts say they are creating the modern slavery phenomenon and they're trying to paint to the American public that the phenomenon starts when someone crosses the border. And they're trying to paint that they have nothing to do with the phenomenon that they created through trade policies, pushing huge, you know, we were interviewing this, in this very program, Manuel Perez Rocha, an expert in Mexico, and they said, this is a humanitarian catastrophe of incredible proportions. And according to Manuel Perez Rocha, the U.S. is creating the catastrophe and then demonizing the victims of the catastrophe that are the refugees that come here. Is that perverse? So I agree with, with the economic analysis. I would only add that we're also seeing the legacy of the wars imposed on Guatemala, on El Salvador, and the Contra War in Nicaragua. These, these were civil wars of the 1980s where the U.S. supported military dictatorships. They supported military juntas. Guerrillas that today will be called terrorists. That would be today but, be called uh, terrorists. But uh, Ronald Reagan was calling them freedom fighters. Yeah, and these so-called freedom fighters even mined the harbors of a sovereign nation, okay, in a clandestine way. And so this tore apart families because you had huge displacement inside these countries and huge flight from these countries. And what we're seeing today, because of, because of that catastrophe in Central America, we're seeing part of the legacy of the tearing apart of the social fabric of these countries. We're seeing part of that legacy now. So if we don't have the historic context, and they are trying to paint the picture that they, they freeze a frame, the frame of the film is at the moment that someone is coming with their kids in this country and they, they say that they don't respect the law. And part of the formula of right-wing populism that we're seeing today is to combine racism, economic insecurity, and blame these victims who are crossing the border for it. Don't blame the 1% who are accumulating social wealth in private hands. No, blame the poor. Is it perverse? It's perverse. And so from an ethical point of view, 
it's very important to decolonize our own minds here in the North and to, and to see the history behind what's happening. We were seeing at the United Nations 73rd uh, Annual Assembly that um, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, were saying we have to defend multilateralism. We have to defend multilateralism. Is multilateralism in the world at stake? It's at stake today because there already is a multipolar world. But the project of the United States right now is to try to roll this back. There's fierce competition for resources, access to resources, influence over governments. But if the United States thinks that through permanent war and coercion, they're going to win the hearts and minds of peoples throughout the world, it's a grave mistake. The disasters of Libya and Iraq are not Syria, and now Syria, and Yemen, the worst humanitarian catastrophe going on right now in the world. So talk about humanitarian crisis again. We see the double standard. We see the double. So no, it, it's already a multipolar world, and what we need uh, is a policy, a U.S. foreign policy and trade policy based on cooperation, based on dialogue, not coercion and war. You're a professor of philosophy, and, uh, and you were studying a philosophy and tell us about precisely your, your findings. Yeah, I, I've been uh, studying closely the philosophy of liberation, ethics of liberation of uh, Enrique Dussel, um, who's Which now is? based, he's from Argentina, but he's been based in Mexico for many years now. Uh, but the ethics, ethics of liberation, though it's a philosophy born in the South, in the Americas of the South, it has universal appeal and application. The reason is because the principles of the, of the ethics of liberation include the idea that we should be promoting human life in harmony with our ecosystem, in community. And how do we do this? Is that we have to use democratic procedures where everyone's voice counts. And finally, whatever we promote, however we promote human life, using democratic procedures, it should be feasible. So these are simple principles, but we put the three together. We can look into a future where there's cooperation instead of war, where we, where we put the economy in function of life instead of private accumulation. We, we respect the environment, which gives us life, rather than destroy it with fossil fuels. So we have to look forward with optimism that we can make a better world. Fred Mills, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me.